welcome to History and Lowell. I am Maritza Groom, and I'm joined by two of the most popular professors at UMass Lowell, <laughs> my buddy Bob Boren and the co-director for the Center for Asian American Studies, Dr. Pitsmai Oi. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Pitsmai Oi. <laughs> Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be with such a great company. So, Absolutely. Um, so it's actually really fitting that we're doing this topic today in this month because it is, um, and I'm learning that there, there's better ways to say this. So there's the, the Asian, Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month this month and Lowell kicked that off with a walk in a rally um, speaking out against anti-Asian hate and violence. So that is what we'll be talking about today. <laughs> and it is something that is not new um, in America. Uh, so let's let's start there. How, how far are we going back, Pitsumai? Well, I would love for us to go back to the inception or the concept of America. Right, so Europeans always had a fascination with Asia, right? So when Marco Polo in, um, landed, like I think it was 1295 in um, Shandao, China, and he found the exotic Asia, he started talking about the silks and the, the, the um, beautiful porcelain. And then he goes back to Italy and starts telling these stories about exotic Asia. And so other, other colonized like, colonial power and empires wanted that, right? So when Columbus sailed the ocean blue to find, right, the 1492, it was actually to look for Asia, to cat for a cafe in India. And so when he landed in um, Dominican Republic and he called the Dominicans Indians because he thought he was in Asia. So our concept, our inception of the United States came from a fascination with Asians. And so that's where I would like to start us off, right? And so our first um, Asians who came here were in the 1600s. Um, it was the Manila Acapulco trade that landed in Mexico, so Chinese and Filipinos. And then the first Filipinos who went from um, like Mexico on up to what is known as Louisiana were the Filipinos in 1625. And so for us, we've always had history in America, but because of our history of invisibility and erasure in his, that nobody knows about this. So Maritza, did you know about that? I had no idea. I had no idea. Erasure is such a huge problem here, especially when it comes to marginalized communities. I like I am blown away right now with this information. And I love history and I'm I'm actually mad that I didn't know this. Yeah. 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 Wow. So for us coming here and being situated in the United States, it's like um, this this Western colonization concept of like we want the same things that the Spaniards had in Latin America, right? The mines and the goats. So when England came to Virginia, they wanted to replicate that same model and and do so with the the native um, the native indigenous tribes here in the United States, but they fought back, right? And so instead, they found other not not gold or silver, but they found like tobacco and cotton, right? To start the, the US economy or at that time, the colonial um, economy, but that you need workers to do that, right? And so the two type of workers is what we know of as either enslavement of our um, a black community or indentured service, right? And so the indentured service were usually um, white servants who came, but there's a difference between an indentured servant when you have a contract that is fixed and then at the end of that contract, then you actually, some of them got land and became landowners, right? And then, but for the slaves, it was not a fixed contract. It was a lifetime um, of servitude, right? And enslavement, and even your children are also enslaved. And so that is what was developing on the East Coast um, economy area, but they need workers also the, on the West Coast. And so when the transatlantic railroad was happening, they went and got, um, and elicited in workers from Asia, right? And so that's what most people hear about, like when we completed the transcontinental, there was 15 to 20,000 um, Chinese worker who worked on that railroad. But if you took a look at the history and see that golden spike picture, you saw no Asian faces, mm -hmm. right? When they said, oh, the railroad was done, we've extended westward. And so one of the famous 
pictures that we love within our Asian American community is Corky Lee, who recently died this year. He was our historian. He went back and found descendants of those 15 to 20,000 workers in the 1800s and reenacted it. And so, um, and there's a picture of their descendants to try to help fight this erasure. And wow. so this is like this constant erasure where we help build the, the economy, we help build the railroads, we help build so many things, and even some of the laws. Like the first actually um, anti-Asian law was um, People versus Hall in 1854. So at the time there was a white miner, right? So we, the miners wanted um, more rights and they wanted more pay, but the, the, the white owners went and solicited Asian miners to use as a wedge, right? So if you don't wanna work for these wages, we, will, we found some other people who will, right? And so this low labor, um, so at that time, there was a, a, a white miner named Hall who was angry at this and killed a Chinese miner. And the only witnesses were other Chinese um, miners. And so this happened in, in California. And so he got convicted um, on the trial and he appealed and he appealed to say, well, you don't let black mulattoes and Indians testify against the white men. Why are you gonna let these Chinese and Mongols? So the white supremacists who are on the Supreme Court says, you're right. If we let the, the Chinese testify against the white men, then other of these other non-whites are gonna wanna testify. So that was the first act of anti-Asian um, discrimination that was codified as part of our institutional oppression. And mm -hmm. so that was 1854. And then a couple of years later, the Page Act of 1875 was prohibiting the entry. So that's your first anti-immigrant law act where um, was prohibiting Chinese women um, to come to the United States because the Chinese men came as laborers for the mines and, and for the railroads. The Chinese women wanted to come and, and reunite with them, but there was fear, right? There's a xenophobia, which is a fear or dislike for China, Chinese people and the language and their culture. So they didn't want a Chinese culture um, to come and, and develop. And so this act says we, these Chinese women who are coming, they're actually coming for lewd and immoral purposes. Mm -hmm. And because there was a small section of women, when women came, there was no economic opportunities for them. And some of them went into sex work. So that was a small population. And during that time, they were like, no, they started to generalize and stereotype any way Asian coming to the United States or here for a prostitution. And that was not true. Um, but mm -hmm. that was a way for them to stop um, the Chinese immigration, right? So if we have a law to prohibit people from coming in, and so that was the Page Act of 1875, to then the Chinese Exclusion Act is what most people hear about, right, of 1882, where it's a 60 year ban of immigrants. It was their way of um, keeping us as this perpetual foreigner that it doesn't belong here, can't lay stakes, can't develop families, are not part of the economy. And so that was happening in the laws at the time, but the hate and the discrimination that people are seeing also was also enacted on our bodies through violence. So the largest lynching in US history is the Chinese massacre of 1871, where it was a lynching of 17 Chinese men and boys by 500 white and Hispanic rioters in Los Angeles, California. And then there, there was other massacres that happened, um, Rock Spring Massacre of 1885, where 28 Chinese miners were killed, 15 were wounded, and then hundreds were forced out of town by 150 white vigilante miners in Rock Spring, um, Wyoming. And so again, right, they were used as a wedge against the, um, the miners or these other people, but they then the local folks who were there saying they are coming to take our jobs, right? So this per perpetual foreigner stereotype, but also this stereotype that you, they're here to take our jobs, that we still hear this day and age, right? And even the last time we had a ma major plague was the 1900s, like between um, the bubonic plague of 1900 to 1904. They contained the Chinese in, in San Francisco Chinatown and did not allow anybody to leave. So that xenophobia that we think is new, right? Kung Fu, no, it actually was existing in 1900s. And so none of this is, is new when we talk about violence. And then most people know about the Japanese and internment camp of the 120,000 Japanese Americans who were interned in Texas, Indiana, North Dakota, um, New Mexico, and Minnesota. Um, so for us, 
I talked to um, with some of our elders, like some of our Nisei who were interned as high school students. They're like, I've always been afraid of in, in the United States. So that's sort of like the historical backdrop of the, um, the, the violence. But with the Atlanta shooting, we have to, so there is racism and sexism, but the misogyny that we have to also contextualize. So the PAGE Act um, stereotype women as hypersexualized, right? Mm -hmm. And so when the young man says, oh, I have a sex addiction, right? And then he blames it on these Asian women. That is our years in history of sort of this image of the Asian women as this hypersexualized individual. But we forget that when we enacted our imperialist wars in part of Asia, like the Philippines and Korea and Japan, the US military actually um, helped perpetuate these things by having um, the sex camps around the military bases, mm. right? And so, um, so that this image of, of um, women as hypersexualized are actually were supported by our US government and also our US military. So again, that is not new as well. And it has been a long line of history behind that too. Wow. And the courts also, as I understand, uh, with the Chinese Exclusion Act around World War I, the courts and then Congress extended the Exclusion Act to cover the Philippines, Japan, yeah. um, India as well, I believe. In the history books, they refer to it as the Asiatic Bard Zone. Yep. Right? And that basically it would be extended. And then there's a couple of Supreme Court cases around the same time and the turn of the century that essentially okay the exclusion and, um, and in a way say it's okay to try to physically remove people from the US because they represent a possible security threat. And the Supreme Court rules, even though we're not at war with China, we might be someday. Mm -hmm. um, therefore, we have the right now to decide to exclude or in some ways force out or um, do some harm to this community because they might eventually become an enemy. And so it, the, the court cases are really, the court cases came back up again. It's interesting after 9-11 mm -hmm. and the Japanese yeah. Internment Act as well came up again after 9-11 and people in the White House at the time, looked back at those things and said, well, it was okay then, why isn't it, why isn't it the same thing now? Why can't we take all the um, Arab Americans that are living throughout the United States and you know, claim they represent a security threat? And I think people don't, and what you're saying makes them, is important because I don't think people realize when, when you sort of turn the blind eye to the courts or the law or whatever, taking away a whole body of people's rights, by logical extension, they can do that again, if once you've let them do that. And so the Chinese Exclusion Act is really, I think, as you said, that's the beginning of what ultimately we get to when we get to quotas with immigration in the 1920s. It's the logical sort of conclusion of that conversation. And everybody just sort of stood by while it happened to, um, to the Chinese population. Yeah, lots of the, the original court cases are impacting some of the issues right now. Like there was a one called Wong Wing versus United States, where mm -hmm. it was a case about um, the court found that immigration courts could not like detain non-citizens rather than right um, to prevent them from further crimes of deportation. But the largest group of of people, the Southeast Asians, are the ones being deported now, right? And that was like in 1896. So a lot right. of the the court cases that Bob is talking about sets the precedence for what we do now. Right, and they're not thinking about, well, that there was a, the whole birther movement was like, cause Wing was actually born in San Francisco. So he is a citizen. So he could not be considered, um, you know, a non-citizen, but that's when they had then after that decision decided that anyone who was born in the United States are a citizen and therefore could not be legally detained and then deported. But the Southeast Asian refugees who had come did not know about this, so they didn't become citizens, but they came as refugees, had green cards, legal residency, um, but were not citizens. And so that's the clause where they said, well, they're not citizens, we can deport them under the, the, the act. So. Right. And I mean, in the Internment Act as well, the majority of people were citizens. Mm -hmm. 
right? And so just the whole question of due process and, right? I mean, there were no charges. There was nothing filed against anybody. They were just taken. They lost their businesses. They lost their homes, their farms, their land, whatever it would be. And I know when I talk to my students about it, they say, well, wait, they can't do that. They can't, they're citizens. They have, they, they have a right to a trial, you know, try, try a wow. jury trial and, you know, trial by, you know, ci you know, citizens, you know, from their community and all this. I said, yeah, no. I said, that's the, the, it's an executive order. And so we've left ourselves open in this country to that sort of rule, right? I mean, and the other thing about that I find interesting when I talk to my students about this, but also people in the community, is that this is done by a Democratic president, President mm -hmm. Franklin Roosevelt, who for most liberals, most Democratic Party liberals think Franklin Roosevelt could walk across the Merrimack River and not sink. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, but he's the person that, he's the person that signed the executive order. Um, mm -hmm. So it's not a, and so sometimes people, I, I mean, when we're going through President Trump, I think people think all evil emanated from President Trump, but what you're talking about is this is a long history and it's done, it's done by Democrats, Republicans, whatever. Um, it, yeah. It's not confined to a particular party or a particular you know, genre of politics. Um, it's pretty, as you've described it, it's pretty pervasive. Right, and it's perpetuated, it seems, by policy and by those in power. Like you said, whether, whether, whatever side of the aisle you're on, and, and then we see those things trickle down in the rhetoric that is used by folks. And this is also why we do this, because if people don't know the history and they don't understand the context that these things even originated in, they don't even question themselves. They don't question why this is happening. And, and then they'll frame it as this is a new thing. But mm -hmm. a lot of even the, uh, the crime bill that's just been passed we're seeing that these, these hate crimes being reported, it's not, it's not that the hate crimes are new, it's that the reports are now coming in. There is an uptick in reports because people are saying this is something that needs to be addressed. But that doesn't mean that these things were not happening already. Mm -hmm. And people don't understand that and they don't understand how not knowing in the erasure also just perpetuates this violence. Yeah. And then the whole cultural aspect of it, we have a culture of silence where we don't report because some of us, when you, we have reported, have been taken away and put into concentration camps or, mm. or and never been seen again. And so you have a generational difference too between some of the our like Southeast Asian elders who have post-traumatic stress disorder over don't report, keep your head down, don't rock the boat because the last time we did that, they came and took us away. Right. And then the young people are saying, I want to be out there. I want to be marching with the East movement. I want to be out there doing, you know, anti-Asian rallies. And they're like, we fear for your safety. Right. And so for them, it's, it's a safety issue all around because you can't trust, like Bob said, the people in the power because they have been, they've used this information against us prior. And so it doesn't, and that was with Asian governments who look like us as opposed mm -hmm. to even here in the United States where they don't mm -hmm. look like us and they're still enacting these sort of oppressive um, strategies and, and policies. And so what ends up happening to the young people is you hear the rhetoric like perpetual corner and stereotype that for them, they get questions of like microaggressions and micro assaults on them. Like, where are you from? You speak mm -hmm. English so well and you're smart in math and science, right? That model minority. And they're like, if I'm struggling, then I don't, I don't ask for help. I don't Right, like I, I have to fit into this, this stereotype where I'm supposed to be high achieving, but if I'm struggling, then I'm not gonna get the help I, I'm in need. And I don't know how to ask for it because my, my family has taught me not to talk um, about like the bad stuff. And so it, it's right. in a double bind for some of our young people in trying to make sense of this um, because their understanding of the racism and the institutional oppression that they're going through it, with the historical trauma and the racial trauma of their family. And so then they say, what do I do with this? Like, where can I go? Because um, my families are not gonna give me those strategies and my teachers don't even know this history. Like some of our young people know more than our, the educators in, in our classrooms. So that's, that's the tricky part too. So I'm excited that like California had enacted a bill around ethnic studies and like there was some talk about being able to incorporate Asian American studies also in Massachusetts so that then they get to learn about this. Um, 
because the current K-12 curriculum, um, and even in the higher ed, we don't, we have one course at UMass Lowell called Intro to Asian American Studies, right? There is not um, even a predominance of Asian American studies in any of the colleges and universities. UMass Boston has a great program. They have over um, 20 um, classes on it, but they're the only one of, of standing. Harvard doesn't have it, none of the Ivies, right? Like none of the private schools where you think you should have it. Um, so. And you would think is, that in Lowell, we would have it is considering that the second largest population of people here are Asians. Mm -hmm. And that's that just seems like a no brainer to me. And it should be implemented in all of the schools from the earliest grade levels up. I don't, it, representation is important. We know this and we know that learning this information is crucial to how we go forward as a society. So it just, it, that, it blows my mind, but I know that you're doing this work. You're, you're pushing for this work to be done, right? But you remember what Paulo Freire said, like education is political. We are being taught the things they want us to learn. And so there's a reason why it boggles your mind because you're a rational being who centers like voices and understanding and, and representation. But if that's that's against our white supremacist theories and model, we don't want you to feel a sense of belonging. We don't want you to see yourself in the curriculum. We don't want we want you to assimilate. We want you to learn the white ways of being and knowing and doing. And we want you to stay in your place. We don't actually want you to learn our skills and then you know, deconstruct our systems of power. No, know where you belong and you stay there. And so that's why it, it is purposeful. So this, there's a reason why we have these things. So. Yeah, I mean, and the, and the exclusion acts, the page act, the, the things that you were talking about earlier in terms of the history, behind it all was the argument that was being made that people, um, that people from Asian countries are unassimilable. Mm -hmm. And so the benchmark or the way to Sort of decide who could come and who couldn't couldn't come over time became who could best fit in and that meant who could best fit in to the to exactly what you just described the sort of white sort of power structure box that you were supposed to belong in and so then the same language and the same logic is used in the 20s 1920s to dramatically cut off um, immigration from southern and eastern europe because the determination was made in the 1920s that those populations were very much like the Chinese population of the late 19th century in that now all of these folks were unassimilable as well. Mm -hmm. um, and, that the, and now we hear the same thing coming from a variety of news, nightly newscasters, news programs, news commentators that, you know, that, the, that white society is being overrun. Mm -hmm. um, and we hear all these code words again for exactly what you were describing before, which is really disturbing because it gains, it's, I feel like it's gaining currency. I feel like there's definitely a, an uptick in people sort of using, you know, and they think they're being clever, but it's clear what they're saying um, when they talk about white society. It's like, what was it, Rick Santorum last week talking about how when, when, when the colonizers came, um, they were genius because they worked on a blank canvas and yeah. built, a, built a country. <laughs> and it's like, wait, how? and then after he did it, people started, you know, rightly criticizing him. Wait, no, there were people here and they had yeah. done a bunch of stuff, dude. Um, but then all the same news programs had him back on all this past week trying to explain what he meant. And I'm thinking, why? <laughs> Yep. Why aren't you having the people? Why aren't you having the people that he erased mm -hmm. on to talk about why he's a fool? <laughs> it's like, the genocide, right? So you start off with an ideological oppression of white is better, right? So at the time, it's white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, right? They are the ones, right? And so anyone other, right? So that those were the Italians, those were the Irish who were not part of this elite mass, the wasp in the beginning, right? like Bob was talking about. And so if you think you are the best and you're at the top, right? And you use this, your, your scientific enlightenment stage of saying, we're gonna categorize people, right? We categorize the plants, we categorize the animals. Now we're gonna categorize the people. Right. And this is the group that stays at the top, right? And so then we're gonna create this whole structure. But first we've got to get a blank slate, Bob. We got to totally annihilate the native indigenous tribes. So they weren't there. If they are stupid enough not to claim land and not to stake their claim, then this is ours, all ours for the taking, right? And so no one talks about the first genocide of, of our indigenous 
tribe. And even the way we talk about Native Americans now, it's like they don't exist anymore, right? So it's always in the past. They have a feathered hat or that, right? So it's like um, Thanksgiving is the only time or when we see them on the Redskins and on any of our mascots, but they are in past tense. We don't talk about them in present tense, right? And so this is where it's so tricky where they're like, we have even eliminated a whole group of people on the white canvas called the United States history. So then they can put in their white structures or then after, okay, now we're gonna, you know, bring in the Slavs because all of these ones who can now assimilate because before there was Irish need not apply, right? Mm -hmm. Jewish are not part of our in-group. And so people forget when they were otherized. And so now that it's been normalized that whites. And so when I talk to teachers, I'm like, I don't have a culture because my I'm white. And I always feel sad because I'm like, you don't even understand that you have been silenced and you have been erased in all of your history and culture, right? Because the only thing you know about being Irish is St. Patrick's Day. I am so sorry, right? And you deserve to know more about the rich history of your people, just like me. Right. And, and Lucky Charm cereal. Yeah, like you deserve to learn, right? And so I have Irish Catalyst who said, Fitzmai, did you know we already have a wall? in Ireland. We, so we know all about building walls, right? So like from the, the North Ireland, right? And the Southern North Ireland. South, yeah. yeah. So that rich history, none of our Irish students learn about. So when we talk about building a wall, right? And then like my Chinese friends being fun, he's like, oh, we already got the wall. You can take selfies on the Great Wall because that was us building a wall against Kuba Klan, right? So everybody has histories of wall when Trump tries to yep. say let's build a wall here. But because- and he invented we, it, yeah. Yeah, he thinks he invented it. But when you don't have this historical context for all of our communities, then then they don't understand that they don't have um, rich identity and culture to celebrate. And so when we talk about culture diversity, they think it's about people of color and not their cultural identity. Like I would love to know more about other white ethnicities besides the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> we're, we're coming up on time here and I hate to end this conversation because this is this is always what happens. We get so like into it and it's so rich and good. And and, and I love that. And I kind of like ending there where we can say, you know, this is, this is important for all of us. Erasure has happened to all of us. And right now I want to, but I do want to take a moment to say, I, I, I hope that people are doing their research. I hope that people are doing their homework. And I know that maybe it took for awful things to happen to the Asian community for people to start caring. But I hope now that you care in an authentic and genuine way and you uplift our Asian community members because it is a crucial time that we all stand together against hate and against violence. Uh, so thank you so much, Pitsumai, for coming on today. Thank you, Bob, of course, for always being awesome. You two are amazing. And thank you all for tuning in. This has been History and Lowell.